But what I'll try to share with you today is um, a bit about the journey that we've been through at ATA over the past eight years or so, uh, reflect on what we've learned, uh, and maybe uh, highlight some of the key themes that I think might be relevant for ILRI as you embark on your um, kind of institutional planning process and your evolution as well. Clearly, ILRI is a much larger, deeper organization than ATA is. We're only about eight years old. And, and the story of the ATA begins with a conversation that late Prime Minister Mendes had with Bill and Melinda and asked them, what can the Gates Foundation do to support Ethiopia in transforming its agricultural sector? And I was at the foundation at the time, and uh, I was actually tasked with go and swing for the fences, come up with an idea. And uh, a pretty daunting task, as you can imagine, to have the prime minister of a country ask, transform our agricultural sector. And clearly, I, I realized this is well beyond my depths um, as a program officer at the foundation. And I actually reached out to the CGIR and your colleagues at IFPRI and asked them if they could support us in coming up with some ideas. But I also asked McKinsey to partner with us. And it was a, a unique partnership between McKinsey and, and IFPRI, which are completely different organizations that think very differently about how to solve a particular problem. And that itself was uh, a challenge in, in managing uh, those types of different organizations. But at the end of the day, the recommendation that we provided to uh, Prime Minister Mendes was that you needed a dedicated organization to lead the process of transformation. Um, and that dedicated organization, in looking at other countries in, in, uh, uh, such as Korea and Taiwan, was something that was an accelerator or a, a, a catalyst working on systemic issues. So that's the entity that was uh, formed. And, and Prime Minister Mendes, in his wisdom, said, Gates Foundation, thank you for this recommendation. I have two additional requests. Number one is, please, can you give me some core funding to get this thing up and running? Uh, and number two, he said, Khalid, since you're the guy who came up with this idea, you come and run it so I know who to blame if it doesn't work. <laughs> and again, I thought to myself, what, what have I gotten myself into? But when we started the ATA, it had, by regulation, three big um, objectives or mandate areas. The first was to undertake systemic, um, I'm sorry, to undertake studies to identify what were the critical bottlenecks in the agricultural sector. And in this way, it kind of resembled some of the CG centers, such as ILRI, in that we were tasked to come up with ideas as a knowledge-based organization. So that was the first big mandate area. The second one was to support the implementation of these ideas through whatever mechanism existed in the country to implement the ideas that we'd come up with. And then finally, it was to create integration and coordination across different institutions that were implementing these ideas. Now, these are broad mandate areas, and for me, again, a bit daunting because I said, what do I do with this? They're, they're just a series of different things to do. What does the business model look like? And, and somebody who worked in the private sector for many years that was a bit challenging because we could churn out a whole bunch of studies. We could do a whole lot of capacity building of partners. We could even integrate different partners, but what does the end product look like? So we actually backed up and said, what do we want to achieve? At the end of the day, generating studies for the sake of studies wasn't going to be enough. So we said, what is the prime objective? Let's start there and then use the mandate areas as tools of achieving that big objective. And we came up with three big uh, objectives. The first was to improve the lives, and none of these are gonna be very surprising to you, and I suspect they'll be very similar to uh, Ilri's mandate areas, but the first was to improve the lives materially of the 17 million smallholder farmers that exist in Ethiopia. That was number one and foremost. The second was to ensure food security in the country to make sure that Ethiopians always had enough food to eat. And then lastly, it was about changing the structure of the agricultural sector in the country so that it moved from a subsistence-based smallholder farmer-oriented agriculture sector to one that was much more modern, based more, much more on comparative advantage and economies of scale. So those were the three big themes that we wanted to try to solve. 
And then we said, okay, how do we solve these th three big things? Because, again, generating studies and doing capacity building is just going to be a random set of activities. So we came up with kind of a matrix approach to address these three big issues. The first is to try to address the systemic issues at a national level. And the second was to integrate these in specific geographies. So the first part of our business model was what we eventually ended up calling the transformation agenda. And this transformation agenda is a series of interventions that were identified by the Ministry of Agriculture and various stakeholders all around the country, which we brought together in a series of different uh, workshops and meetings and said, what are the big areas that we should focus on? First as program areas. So things like seed and fertilizer and vaccines for livestock or, um, or new breeds that might, be need, that might need to be developed. So those big program areas were first identified. And there's 25 of them that we said, okay, here are the things that we're gonna concentrate on. And then within the 25, we said, let's please identify two to three big things. Let's not try to boil the ocean and try to solve every single problem, but let's come up with two or a maximum of three big things that we're going to solve over five years in each of these 25 areas. And then within these two or three big things, what are the three to five big interventions? No more than five interventions in each of these two to three big things. So a big part of our work was bringing together stakeholders to prioritize, to say, what do you focus on that could make the big systemic changes all around the country? And then once we've identified all of these, what we ended up with was 49 big interventions and 188 different, I'm sorry, 49 big deliverables and 188 specific interventions that needed to be implemented. And then for these 188 specific interventions, there were owners and timelines and a whole bunch of other stuff that we also identified. Right? So that was the first big part of our work. The second one was how do you actually integrate these in specific geographies? So we identified specific parts of Ethiopia where we would integrate these solutions with smallholder farmers. And ultimately we landed on 300 waradas, or districts, 10 commodities, and 30 what we called clusters. And within these, there were about 5 million farmers that we work with. So that's our business model. Right? So we have systemic issues that we deal with at a national level, and then particular geographies where we try to integrate them. As an organization, though, we had to define what do we do? What is our role in this? And to do that, we ended up going back to our mandate areas. And those first three mandate areas that I mentioned, studies, implementation support, and integration and coordination. And for each of these, we also had to develop a way of working. So in the area of studies, what we did was we looked at the IFPRI model of researchers and scientists. We looked at the McKinsey model. And we ended up creating a hybrid between the two. So we have a team of 50 people at the ATA that is a combination of experts that come from places like McKinsey or Bain or BCG, as well as young students that we hire directly from Ethiopian University so that they can actually grow through the ranks and become leaders within our analytics team, married them with technical experts in the different content areas where we're working. So we have an analytics team of about 50 to 60 experts that are constantly generating outputs, which seems like the McKinsey types of decks that you normally see. But where it differs from the McKinsey decks is that it just doesn't provide what to do, but also how to do it. Right? So that's the first part of what we worked on. The second was on the implementation support. And in this area, we had a lot of evolutions and changes. How do you support the Ministry of Agriculture? How do you support the regions of Ethiopia to implement? And we went through a number of different models and eventually ended up with something called a delivery unit approach. And this is something that the uh, Tony Blair Institute and a number of other organizations are now using all across Africa. But it's essentially about program management. It's about identifying what are you, what are you trying to do, 
how are you going to do it, and really just rigorously managing that process. And then finally, this idea of integration and coordination is something that we try to do within the two business models that I talked about. So as we implemented this approach over the first five years of the AT's existence, we realized that things weren't getting done as quickly as we'd wanted. And I'll come back to this topic at the end, but what we ended up doing was going to the prime minister and saying, look, you want to see results, so do we, but providing support by itself is not going to cut it. We need to do something differently. And at that point, we were given a new mandate to directly implement projects. And over the past four years, we've been implementing 25 different projects, which have, has now become the biggest part of our organization. So what, is, what has all this led to? So when I reflect on what we've done at ATA, I think there are four big things that I'm most proud of and I think that have contributed to the transformation of Ethiopia's agricultural sector. The first is the introduction of innovative ideas. So those innovative ideas are at the conceptual level such as the transformation agenda as a mechanism to prioritize systemic issues and how do you solve them. Or the commercialization cluster initiative that I talked about which is the integration of those interventions on the ground. Those types of concepts are things that we've introduced to Ethiopia's agricultural sector. But more than that is some of the projects that we've been working on. So some of you might have heard of our uh, Ethiosis digital soil mapping project, which over the past five years, and this is one of our first projects, over the past five years, we've collected over 150,000 soil samples, bagged them, tagged them, GPS coordinates, the whole thing, and then used wet chemistry and spectrophotometry to analyze the soil, the nutrients within the soil, so that we can provide targeted fertilizer recommendations to farmers all the way down to the whatever level. This is a big difference from what used to happen in Ethiopia as recently as five years ago, where every farmer in the country, no matter what they were producing, whether it was sesame in the highlands of uh, Tigray or wheat in the lowlands of Somali region, it was 100 kgs of DAP and 100 kgs of urea. It didn't matter what you were producing. It didn't matter what was in the soil. So for us over five years to change the fertilizer recommendations of the entire country, I think is the kind of innovation that we've been able to introduce. So the first big thing for us in terms of a takeaway is the innovations that we've been able to introduce into the sector. The second is the engagement, and I think you'll hear this over and over again in e if you're working in Ethiopia, is how do you engage the private sector? Because in Ethiopia, our public sector has been dominant over most of the economy, especially in agriculture over the past 25 years. So for us, a big part of our work has been how do we broaden the space so that many more actors can engage. And while a lot of people look at our engagement of partners such as OCP, the big Moroccan fertilizer uh, company that's investing over or nearly $3 billion to build a fertilizer factory in Dredoa as a major achievement. That's not where I look to and say that's the big change that we've made. Because attracting foreign direct investment can only get you so far. The big thing that I'm most proud of in terms of our private sector engagement is the small and medium sized enterprises, Ethiopian companies that we've helped to initiate their engagement in the agricultural sector. So be it seed distributors, or well drillers, or even the farmers themselves, be it crop farmers or livestock farmers, having them think of themselves as private sector, as business people, has been one of the major achievements that we've had. Because for too often, over the past 25 years, we think of farmers as beneficiaries. And I think that is one of the biggest problems with development. Farmers are not beneficiaries. Farmers are business people that need access to markets and access to input so that they can generate a livelihood that is supportive of their families. But too often we think of farmers as beneficiaries that need help. Yes, we all need help. 
Right? Are we all beneficiaries in that context? I would argue not. So one of the big things that we've done is make sure that the narrative around farmers is one around business and one around uh, away from the concept of beneficiary. The third big thing that I think ATA has been able to achieve and something that is important is the ability to go to scale. In many instances, organizations such as ATA are very good at piloting ideas and bringing innovations, but they never really go to scale. I think we've been quite fortunate, and I'll come to why we've been able to do this, that many of our activities and projects have actually gone to scale. So the Ethiosis project that I talked about is a national project that has affected farmers all over the country. Another one of our projects called the um, 8028 Farmer Hotline is a mobile-based um, uh, extension service that includes both crop and livestock commodities that provides toll-free services to farmers. Any farmer can call, anybody can call 8028 right now on your mobile phone, and you'll have access to four different languages, Ethiopian languages, that will allow you to get information on everything from nutrition to fertilizer to even climate. And we have over four million farmers signed up and that are using this system over the past four years. So that ability to go to scale, I think, is one of the, the major achievements that we've had. Now, what does this mean and why am I bringing these things up? Because I think there are four key lessons for us that might be interesting and useful for Ilri. The first is we've had to change our business model from what we began as an organization to what we do now because initially the idea of ATA as a think tank, as a knowledge-based organization by itself, was not delivering results as quickly as we wanted. So in Ethiopia, most of you will know, when you work with the government, there is an appetite for data and evidence. They will listen. Policymakers here in Ethiopia will listen if you give them evidence and data. Unfortunately, the translation of that data and evidence into action on the ground is where things fall apart. There are tons of strategies and policies and ideas that have been generated over the years that just literally sit on the shelf. So we had to actually think about how do you execute? How do you take these ideas to the ground? So that was one big learning for us. But the way in which we did that is also a second learning. Because most people, and even ATA initially, our initial translation of how do we translate or how do we move from evidence and policy advice to execution was related to capacity building. So we did a ton of capacity building. We trained people here, there, and everywhere. But still, we didn't see results. So we had to think about this differently and say, why aren't changes happening? And we came to two conclusions. Number one, the people that you train walk out the door the next day especially in the public sector where they're not being paid very much. So the capacity building that we did shifted from human capacity building to institutional capacity building. So what we try to do now is build systems and process within institutions so that anybody in that institution can benefit from them and can execute. And the second thing that we did was change the type of capacity building that we were trying to do. Because as scientists, I think you will automatically gravitate towards capacity building that's more focused towards technical capacity building. And while that's necessary, I would argue that that's not what is missing. What is missing, at least in our context, has been capacity building in problem solving and in execution, in project management. And what we've seen is a great breeder or a great soil scientist does not make a great project manager. Those are two totally different skill sets. So, we had <laughs> so we've had to actually think about how do you teach people how to execute projects? Because those are different skills. Right? How do you teach people how to manage and lead? Because that's very different than working in a lab. 
So those are additional concepts that we've now had to build into the work that we do and the way we engage with partners. Which brings me to my third point, which is all about going to scale can never be done by one organization by itself. We tried that, and frankly, that doesn't work. Right? So this concept of partnerships is something that always comes up, but you've got to make sure that when you're building partnerships, you understand the business model of the organizations that you're working with so that you leverage their best capabilities rather than looking at it purely from your own lens. And that's what we've had to do better and better over time. So we're always asking, what can you bring to the table? What are you good at rather than I need this? So it changes the conversation from one of what do we need to execute to how do we partner with others to get to scale? Which brings me to my final point, which is that ATA has grown from an initial idea that we were only going to be a 50-person organization, 65 maximum, to now nearly 600 people, purely because we've had to evolve and change. Right? So that concept of change and evolution is part of our DNA. And for a lot of people, change and evolution is very difficult. Even within the organization itself, within the ATA itself, most of our colleagues and employees were not ready to change and evolve. But we've made that part of our DNA by putting in systems and processes that dictate change. So for example, all of our projects get launched at 80% design. We never try to launch a project that is 100% perfectly designed because that doesn't exist. It's a fallacy. Right? Just as, like Napoleon said, you know, the best strategy is only as good as the first contact with the enemy. That's the same thing with any project design. It's only as good as the first time that you engage with your partners on the ground and realize, ah, this is not going to work or we've got to change this. So that realization from the start has been one of the founding features of the ATA is anything that we do is only 80% designed from the beginning. That gives us that 20% from the beginning to evolve and change. And sometimes the things that you change are the 80% that you've designed rather than the things that you kept open because you weren't really taking context into consideration. So while project design has been one part of our evolving nature, the organization itself has had to also evolve. And that has been the most difficult part of our journey. Because when you set up teams and then all of a sudden ask those teams to do something different six months later or a year later, that is a very uncomfortable position for people to be in. So it takes a different type of leadership, a different type of approach to make people comfortable with that change. And some of it is really just about recognizing that you're never going to get it right from the start. And recognizing that it is a journey, that it is part of the process. And that eventually, you'll get something right, but even that is right for that context and that right time, and that will change as well. So getting people comfortable with that sense of change and evolution is something that we've had to do. We're not 100% there, but I would suggest that Every organization, especially in the development space, has to do that in order to remain relevant. So these are at least some of the learnings or some of the observations that, that I've made over our journey over the past eight, nine years at ATA. I hope some of them are useful to you, and thank you for your time and attention. <laughs>